sign of the fish. Have I told you the joke about the one-armed fisherman? You caught one that long. <laughs> Start off with a little humor tonight. I'm sure you're all a very little. Uh, sure you're all familiar with the sign of the fish. You've probably seen it on the backs of cars and emblems, and maybe in some jewelry that people are wearing. Nobody that I've been able to find knows for sure how this symbol got started, when it got started. But there are a number of reasons why it makes sense that this symbol would be used. You see, it's very simple. Just two arcs put together so that they overlap on one end or the other. If you take the five letters of the Greek word for fish, and that's those are the Greek letters, it's pronounced ichthus. And if anybody in here speaks Greek, please feel free to correct me, but that's how I pronounce it when I see those Greek letters, ichthus. Two syllables, ichthus. You can pronounce that if you want to, ichthus. That's the Greek word. That can be used to make a handy acrostic. That's where you take each one of the letters and something, the letters, each one of the letters means something. And each letter for the Greek word that means fish represents a word in a phrase that is descriptive of Jesus. Now this word ichthus, if you're a, a dinosaur lover or aficionado, if you study those things, wait a minute, we passed the picture. We can't pass that picture. Where'd you go? There it is. It's gone again. That's the way it is when you're fishing. They're, they're biting and then they're gone. This one's the same way. Oh, rascal, come back here. All right, I'll let you go. There he is. All right. If you study these things, this is a fish that is supposedly extinct, but they found other fish they thought were extinct, so they might find this one one day, but this is called the ichthyosaurus. The saurus part means lizard, but the ichthy part is from the Greek, which means fish, so it's a fish lizard because saurus means lizard, but it's not a lizard, it's a fish. So I just wanted to throw that in there in case that ichthus, that sounds familiar. Well, yeah, the ichthyosaurus is the fish lizard. So take that word, ichthus, the Greek word for fish. And you look at the, the iota, the I, not the eye of the fish, but the letter I or iota. And we're familiar with this Greek letter because there's a phrase that goes with it. Uh, not one iota, not one iota. I like to pronounce it iota, so it's distinct from the hero in Star Wars, Iota. Sounds too much like him. But that letter is the first letter in the Greek word for Jesus, the name Jesus. Eesus is how you would pronounce his name in Greek, if I understand the Greek correctly. So Eesus would be Jesus' name, and that I in Eesus corresponds with the I in Ichthus. And the next letter would be the chi or the ki, depending on how you would pronounce that Greek letter. It looks like our X, but it has that k sound. And that's for Christos. That's the Greek word Christos there. Christ, Christos, by the way, which means what? Anointed of God, very good. And as for what language, of course? Greek. I'm not gonna ask what the Hebrew is. I don't wanna be embarrassed because nobody knows but who knows? Messiah, all right. Some of it's getting through, I'm so happy. And then the next letter is, and who knows what that Greek letter is? It's a theta. Theta, if, if you know your sororities or your fraternities, you might see it because theta is used a lot. Theos is the word that theta stands for and theos means God in Greek. And then there is the letter Upsilon. They were gonna make something else, but they made a mistake, so they called it Upsilon. See, I wasn't planning on saying any of this stuff when I was thinking about this lesson, but now that I'm up here, it's just kind of coming because Upsilon, that's, that's a funny name for a letter, but that's what the letter's called. It's an Upsilon, it's our U for Weos. That word is Weos, it means son. And in the Greek, you don't see it here, 
but there are little hash marks sometimes over the beginning of a word if it uh, if it has a a vowel and it's called a breathing mark and when it has that mark it's got an it's like it's an h sound so we us we we us you might not pick that up but that's the way it's supposed to be and the last letter is the sigma the s for savior soter or savior so those are the five letters and when you put those together, this is what you come up with. Jesus from the I, the Iota. By the way, I'm, I'm using the capitals here just to confuse you a little more. Capital Greek letters, the Chi for Christ or key. The Theta, God, Jesus, Christ, God. And that looks like a Y, but that is an Upsilon. That's a capital Upsilon. See why Upsilon is a good name for it? Looks like a mistake, but it's not. And there is the Sigma, capital Sigma for Savior. Jesus Christ, God, Son, Savior. Some would say Son of God and Savior, and either one of those are fine. So that's, that's the acrostic from the Greek word for fish. And we might wonder why in the world... Are we using the word for fish to talk about Jesus? But when you, when you think about it, there are a lot of reasons why it, it makes sense. His first apostles were fishermen. Can you name them? Peter, Andrew, James, John. Those four were fishermen. And they left their nets and they followed Jesus. So he had fishermen as apostles. Those were his first ones. What did he tell them they would do? You're going to fish for men. I'm taking fishermen to be my apostles, but you're going to fish for men. I don't think that was on purpose. I think it just kind of worked out that he was able to use that kind of dad humor, uh, if you want to call it that. He used fish often in his teaching. Can you think of any examples? Sermon on the Mount, he says, talking about asking God for things. If you ask your father for a fish, will he give you a snake? No, he wouldn't do that. He'd give you a fish. A good father would. Uh, the, the dragnet. Somebody mentioned the dragnet? Cast your net out into the sea and you take in a whole bunch of fish. And what do you do when you pull the net in? You cast out the bad fish and you keep the good fish. He used fish often in his teaching. Tax money from a fish. What did he tell Peter? Question came up. Do you guys pay that tax? Peter, take your hook, go down to the water, throw it in, pull up a fish. Look inside the fish and you'll find your tax money. That's how we do it every April, right? See, you got to be careful how you interpret some things in the Bible. There, there are probably some people somewhere who say, this is how we're going to get our tax money because I read it in the Bible. No, it's not the way it works. But Jesus did use a fish. He could have done it anywhere. He could have said, Peter, go out in the big field and watch for a bird to fly by and that bird will drop you a coin. He could have done it that way, but he didn't. Maybe because Peter was a fisherman, not a bird hunter. I don't know. He fed thousands with just a few fish. He did it on at least two occasions we know about. Keeping up with those. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so Jesus would be in the earth. That's the sign that Jesus said he would use. So there's another reference to a fish. And we can argue whether or not it was a fish. Oh, come on now. There we go. He ate fish after his resurrection. Actually, he did it twice. But you remember when he was gathered with the apostles the first time, he appeared in the room and they were doubting. They thought maybe he's a ghost. And he said, oh, give me something to eat. And what did they give him? A piece of honeycomb and some fish. And he ate those before them so they could see that he was in his body, a resurrected body, but a, res or, but a body nonetheless, not a spirit, not an apparition. And he ate fish at that point. And he enabled the apostles to make a huge catch of fish. Remember this after the resurrection? Hey, you caught anything? Oh, we fished. A, throw something on the other side there. And, and they pulled in the fish. And they said, it's the Lord. That's how they knew. And Peter threw his coat on and swam in the shore. He prepared a meal of fish for them when they got to the beach. They swam in the shore. They brought the boats in. And on the beach, he had a, a fire made, 
some coals and he had baked some bread and had some fish. Doesn't that sound good? A meal by the Sea of Galilee of fresh broiled fish and bread. And I don't imagine you could get a better chef. Jesus makes you a meal. Wow. How neat was that? Would that be? Well, that was all of those. And this thing's kind of touchy tonight. Let me back up to where I know I was. Okay, that's the end of that one. Go one more. Ahead, forward. There we are. Yeah. It, it wasn't on the screen, but it was behind me? Okay, maybe it's just slow coming to the tablet. So this is, this is the symbol. And you can imagine anybody could make this symbol. It's very easy to make. And so... The, the thought is, the idea is that maybe when the Christians were being persecuted and they didn't want to, to freely give out their identity as a Christian, maybe they're standing next to somebody having a conversation and they want to know, is this guy a Christian or not? How can I find out without endangering myself? And so you just take a stick or your, your toe or your sandal and you just make a little fish sign on the ground. And if they know what that symbol is, oh, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. That's why I made that symbol. So, so you would know that I was a Christian. Oh, I'm a Christian too. And if they, they weren't a Christian, they probably wouldn't know that symbol. That's the idea. And they would just think you're doodling on the ground. And you make that symbol and they don't respond. You probably know, okay, he's, he's not a Christian. He's not a believer. So that's probably what it was used for. However, we use Christian symbols today. Uh, I mean, it's pretty hard to miss the one behind me. Symbol of a cross. And a lot of people use that as jewelry. They wear it for whatever reason to remind themselves that they are Christians, to spread the word of Christ so somebody will see the cross and think of Christ. And I don't personally have any problem with people doing that. I, I don't choose to do it myself uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them, I'm afraid that while I'm wearing a cross or displaying a cross, I might say or do something that's not Christian, and I, I don't want to bring reproach on the name of Christ by my behavior when, when doing it that way. However, if, if I'm displaying the attributes of Christ, that's something that Jesus said would be noticed. He even said, uh, let your good works be seen among men that they might glorify your Father who's in heaven. And again, I'm not saying that means it's wrong to wear crosses, but I also, I, I consider the fact that Neither Jesus nor the apostles ever seemed to use them, any kind of a symbology, any kind of a piece of jewelry or anything like that. And so I wonder, all right, if, if they didn't use it, that gives me pause if, if I were to go to use it. And again, I'm not saying anybody who wears crosses, there's anything wrong with that. This is just some, some thinking I'm doing about this, and I don't think it's wrong one way or the other. When I graduated high school, uh, a friend of mine, who was also a believer, gave me a cross that was about that tall and, and about that wide, appropriately wide as a cross. And it was made out of aluminum, so it was very light. And it was designed so that you could put it in your pocket and just carry it. Nobody else would see it but you. But every time you put your hand in your pocket to get some change or to get your pocket knife or your keys or whatever, you would touch that cross and it would remind you that was the idea that you're a Christian, that you have a Savior. Maybe remind you, put you in mind to pray which might be something good to have this month. Now, maybe we should have done that, ordered uh, 200 little aluminum crosses that we could put in our pockets and remind us to pray. And I found that to be a very handy item to have for a while. I don't have it anymore. I don't know what happened to it. But at any rate, there are purposes for such symbols that do seem to be productive. Whatever the, 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 the belief you have about those things uh, We'll go to this last slide here where I think it's noteworthy that we thank God that we don't necessarily know the symbol of the fish because we don't need it. We don't have to have a secret code. We don't have to have a, uh, a clandestine way of letting people know that we are Christians. We can freely talk about Christ. We can go to a restaurant, order a meal, Pray over that meal right there in public, not at all to make a scene, but simply as you would any time, uh, 
You think about it, do you thank the, the waiter or the server when they bring your food? Well, of course you do. They bring you a drink, you, oh, thank you, thank you. They bring you your food, thank you. They bring your appetizer, thank you. They bring you the check, you don't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> No, you even thank them for that because they're, they're serving you. And so you think, and if you thank your server, why not thank the God who provided everything you've got to enjoy there at, at that meal? I just think it's a good thing. I don't think there should be any, any shame at all connected with that, praying out in public. Jesus wasn't talking about that when he said to go into your closet to pray. He was talking about those who pray in public in order to be seen. But we're simply praying in public to give thanks like Jesus did when he fed thousands with fish and bread. He openly thanked his father through prayer before he fed those things, uh, fed people with those things. So all this being said, it's great to live in a free country, isn't it? So I'm glad we got moms. I'm glad we got freedom. Are you upset that this lesson is short tonight? You're afraid to say no, aren't you? Because, oh, well, that won't be spiritual. This should be a 35 minute lesson. All right, I'll talk about something else for 20 more minutes. No, I won't. I, I hope this has been somewhat insightful, though, with regard to the sign of the fish and how it, it has been used and perhaps how it came into being and why it came into being. But tonight, uh, our sign is Jesus Christ. He lives in our heart. He lives in our actions. He lives in our speech. He lives in our thoughts. And that's what we show forth to the world. So tonight, if you are outside of Christ and you would like to put him on in baptism, I don't know if anybody here needs that, but if you are, we want to talk to you about it. But if you need the prayers of the church, we have those to freely offer. Just as God has given us, we give to you. So let's stand and sing the invitation song for anybody who might want to avail themselves of those blessings. <laughs>